The Federal Reserve being able to drop us down to 3% inflation is a huge positive sign that they're navigating the economy well. Ideally, they would like to be at the 2% range, but they've also adjusted it to 2.5 or 2.8%. But before we get all kumbaya and happy, I have to express a few points of concern before I go further. There is something called the U.S. Producer Price Index, also known as the PPI. While the CPI measures the price of consumer goods, the PPI measures the price of wholesale goods pretty much from the factory to retail. And that went up three base, sorry, 30 basis points more than expected. It was projected to grow at 2.3%, but it went up to 2.6. And there have been times where the PPI going up means that the CPI is also going to increase, but there is a lot more wiggle room from PPI to CPI. The inverted yield curve is when the 10-year treasury bond yield is lower than the two-year treasury bond yield. So look at this graph. The orange is the two-year yield and the blue is the 10-year. And as you could see, the yield curve has been inverted for well over a year. A fundamental concept you have to carry in your mind when you're thinking about treasury bonds is the higher their yield, the cheaper they are to buy. So if you were holding 10-year treasury bonds when they were at a 1% yield, you bought them for a much higher price than you could buy them today since the yield is 4.2%. It also means that anybody who bought 10-year treasuries when the yield was 1% has lost a good amount of money. That's why there's been so much economic and financial uncertainty. The cheaper two-year treasury yield means that people are more uncertain about the economy in the next two years than they are in the next 10 years. When the market is healthy, banks borrow in the short term, like in the two-year period, and they lend in the long term, in the 10-year period. So their loans will make them more money compared to what they've borrowed, so they get a net yield interest. But because of the inverted yield curve and all the market uncertainty, the banks can't even really do the reverse. Because interest rates are so high across the board, banks are finding it increasingly more difficult to borrow and lend. So is just the regular institution, the regular small business, and the regular person. Hence, we are in this huge economic turmoil. Now, the inverted yield curve is not 100% effective. There is always room for error. I believe it is predicted did seven or eight out of the 10 recessions. And for anyone who's a statistician like I was, that's nowhere near enough to say it's a certainty. Then there's the fact that we are contending with a crash in the commercial real estate market as evidenced by this chart in the changes of commercial real estate prices across the board. The Fed started raising interest rates. It dropped about 23%. And why this is such a major blow to the US economy is that banks from small to very large are heavily exposed to the commercial real estate market because to them, at least before the economy went haywire, this was an easy moneymaker. Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, has made this very clear because a lot of these commercial real estate mortgages were put into bonds called mortgage-backed securities. That's exactly what they are. If I take a loan to buy a piece of commercial real estate, I have to pay that mortgage. Well, that mortgage gets sold on the market as a bond. So the mortgage that I am paying to the holder of my commercial real estate loan is kind of like their interest. And in a healthy economy, that's what happens. But we're not in the most healthy economy right now. Imagine buying a piece of commercial real estate for $10 million, and then all of a sudden it goes down to $7 million. You're still paying a mortgage for that $10 million on a property that's lost $3 million, which means that hundreds, if not thousands of banks all across the country have seen their commercial real estate portfolios collapse. And it's this collapse that has led to an unrealized loss on investment securities over $500 billion. And those unrealized losses include treasury securities along with these mortgage-backed securities. Which leads us to the fact that on April 19th of this year, the Fed announced that 1,804 banks have tapped their emergency lending facility. BTFP, the Bank Term Funding Program, which peaked around May. 4,600 banks in this country, so we are talking about 40% of all the banks that have had to borrow some kind of emergency funds. About $17 trillion total in bank deposits all around the country, and about $10 trillion of those dollars are insured by the FDIC. 
The FDIC right now has $125 billion to cover banks that fail, to cover the deposits. And these 1,804 banks, if you average it out, have between 15 to 40 percent of the entirety of FDIC insured deposits, between 1.5 to $4 trillion. And let's say only 10 percent of these banks are actually in trouble then the FDIC would still have to cover between $150 billion to $400 billion, while they only have $125.3 billion. But for all we know, maybe those 10% of 1,800 banks, maybe they're very, very small in deposits, and just maybe the FDIC, with its current amount, can cover it. But it still drums up a bit of concern. The Federal Reserve itself is facing its own challenges. All the banks in America have to make small remittances to the Federal Reserve so the Federal Reserve can just run the basic plumbing of our financial system. Not just for us, but I think also for the world. But because of the bank failures in 2023, the Federal Reserve said, okay, you don't have to give us those remittances. Meaning that the Federal Reserve is owed about $180 billion dollars from our banking system. Now that I said all the bad stuff, let's get to the good news. Despite all the bad stuff I told you, we still managed to get inflation down to 3%. That is no mean feat. Lo and behold, the 10 year and the two year yields have been dropping as a result. And that's important because the average 30 year mortgage rate in this country is between 1.5 to 2% higher than the 10 year yield. So the more that this yield drops, the lower the mortgage rate will. So if the Fed can keep steering us in this direction, then we will see these treasury yields go down and the value of the actual bonds will go up. Meaning that this portfolio here of hold to maturity losses will start to diminish and may even start turning into gains. And remember how I scared you about BTFP before? Well, look how it dropped from 168 billion at its peak to 105 billion. So it looks like the lower inflation is actually being shown with the banks no longer receiving so much emergency funding. And guess what's happened to the money supply that has been overprinted? massively from the years 2018 to 2021. It has dropped quite a bit by over $1.5 trillion, and it has stayed flat. The Federal Reserve has been on a hack and slash mission to reduce its balance sheet. And look, it's been working. Right now, the Federal Reserve is letting $25 billion of treasuries come to maturity without renewing them. And they are still doing the same thing with $35 billion a month of mortgage-backed securities. So the Fed has dropped its balance sheet from about $9.1 trillion in 2022 to $7.22 trillion. They want to get to this level, around $4 trillion or even $3 trillion. And the question was to the Federal Reserve, can you actually reduce your balance sheet and keep the economy afloat? The answer is yes. Then there's this huge invisible element in the room called the reverse repo agreements. We've talked about two forms of quantitative tightening, you know, letting bonds come to maturity and then of course raising the interest rates. But there's something that most people don't talk about and it's the reverse repo agreements. When the Fed raised its balance sheet, they gave a lot of liquidity, a lot of cash to these banks to make sure they don't collapse. Banks don't like having just cash. They want to borrow against it or they want to lend it. They want to do something to make money off of it. So the Federal Reserve has a little bit of a compromise called reverse repos. And it's done overnight. So the Federal Reserve sells certain securities to these banks and holds onto their money. And the overnight interest rate is the effective federal funds rate of 5.33%. Yeah, it's high. I'll talk about this later. When that overnight period is over, the Federal Reserve repurchases those securities that they sold to the banks gives them back their money. This allows liquidity to stay trapped in the banks and not put us back on the inflation ride. We peaked around the beginning of 2024 at about 2.5, 2.6 trillion, and we have now dropped to 406 billion. This can suggest, it's not 100%, but it can suggest that the Federal Reserve is less concerned about keeping the liquidity tightened up in the banks. It indicates that there's less need for the Federal Reserve to lock up liquidity so stringently. It also means that there may be more money for the banks to start lending again. Let's journey to the strength of the almighty dollar. Just think of the term quantitative tightening. That's exactly what it is. It's tightening the quantity of the circulation of the US dollar. 
Dollar follows economics, supply and demand. When the supply of dollars drops, demand for it increases. This is the DXY. It measures the strength of the dollar against a basket of other widely circulating currencies. When the DXY is at 100, that means the dollar is okay. Anything below that, it's relatively weak. Anything above it means that the dollar is strong. When COVID was at its worst, we saw the DXY go above 114. People were worried, actually, at that time about a huge contraction in the money supply leading to possibly deflation. That's why we saw so much quantitative easing. Even while inflation was quite high, you see the dollar was still very strong. Now, a strong dollar is usually very bad for U.S. exports. Yet, if you look at our exports, you could see that after COVID, they skyrocketed and they have stayed well above their previous highs. Compare that to China's exports, which is still about $30 billion dollars less than its previous high. China drops the value of their currency to skyrocket their exports, but look, the yuan has not been this low in years and their exports are suffering. So our exports are much healthier than our competitors, even though we are at a strong dollar. And it is our strong dollar that is upsetting the BRICS nations. Right now, 80% of all oil sold is priced in dollars. So guess what? When dollars are more expensive, so is oil. So this $82.24 for oil is actually much higher for India, China. Russia doesn't need our oil. Of course, they have their own, but they do need a basket of goods and commodities that only the Western nations have, and that is priced in dollars, and Russia can't get their hands on it. But because inflation is down to 3%, we've seen the DXY drop a little bit to 104. That's not a bad thing. Look at the DXY compared to the euro, the Chinese yuan, the ruble, and the British pound. Yeah, the ruble is horrible, so is the Chinese yuan. But the euro, European Union, and the British pound, those have been going up in contrast to the little downtick of the US dollar. The EU and Great Britain are some of our largest importers, meaning that our exports are becoming slightly cheaper for them to buy again which makes me optimistic that we are going to start to see even higher monthly exports. But the end-all be-all, for me at least, is this Bloomberg article where they're saying that traders are starting to bet on a supersized Fed rate cut in September, meaning like 50 basis points or 0.5% are at 5.5%. And while we have had much higher interest rates, we may not have had a rate hike that went up this quickly. It's one of the reasons why we had a couple big bank failures in 2023. But if we actually get a rate cut from 5.5 to 5%, then all bets are off. But we would have to keep holding steady with inflation, hopefully see this go below 3%. And if both things happen, inflation goes down and we do get a rate cut, then we will see a melt your face off rally in the stock market. If that happens, you're going to see rate cuts across the board. The federal funds rate will start to be cheaper, meaning that banks can lend to each other at a lower rate, making it easier. I wouldn't be surprised if I saw the remittances start returning to the Federal Reserve. And the bank term funding program, that BTFP of emergency funding that the banks have been getting from the Federal Reserve, we will most likely see that number drop below this. You will see yields from the two-year and the 10-year start to drop. And keep this in mind, the 10-year Treasury bond is kind of like, at least their rate, is like a benchmark for the average 30-year mortgage rate. So we see that the 10-year yield is 4.21%. So the average 30-year mortgage will most likely be 6.2, slightly lower, slightly higher. But if this goes down, then the average 30-year mortgage rate will go down. And that $500 billion in unrealized losses in hold to maturity assets held by banks will most likely become a lot smaller. And a rate cut will not be some magical silver bullet for the commercial real estate market, but it will most likely alleviate some of the pain. So there would start to be a bit more money floating around in the economy. But the crazy thing is the Federal Reserve still wants their balance sheet to go from 7.2 trillion to three or four trillion dollars. While there may be quantitative easing, if there is a rate cut in September, I would not be surprised if they still dropped $25 billion a month in treasuries and $35 billion a month in mortgage-backed securities. Just let them go to maturity and don't renew them. If, if something like this happens in September, a rate cut, the Fed will be dropping its balance sheet but lowering rates. And will the curtailing of the balance sheet be enough to keep inflation down?
Ah, I forgot to mention the thing that makes me the most optimistic about the U.S. economy in the future. The Biden administration has been pushing for manufacturing growth like we haven't seen in 50 years. Over the past 18 months, $220 billion was put into manufacturing construction. And that doesn't include his $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill. The Interstate Highway Act of 1956 was one of the major things that propelled U.S. GDP growth from the 50s to the 60s. If you measure the amount of money put in the Highway Act in today's dollars, it's about 400 billion. The Biden administration has 1.2 trillion dollars, three times more than the Highway Act. The American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, that was mostly stimulus checks that shouldn't count as infrastructure. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, that is actual infrastructure, bridges, roads, highways. Nothing of this magnitude has ever gone into the American economy. Since 2021, only $125 billion has been spent, but over three times that amount of money has already been announced for this infrastructure law. The multiplier of infrastructure investment into an economy that's struggling can range from 2 to 3.1, meaning that at best, every $100 you put into infrastructure can become $310 in later GDP. So yeah, there are a lot of struggles that we are currently facing and that come up ahead, but we are also dealing with a lot of potential booms. The Federal Reserve took a lot of risks with such stringent quantitative tightening, but their alternative was facing hyperinflation. And the entirety of our banking system was on a little bit of shaky territory, maybe even a lot, but so far. Inflation has come down from 9.2% to now 3%. And for those of you who may not understand exactly what inflation is, when inflation goes down, it doesn't mean that prices go down. It means that the rise in prices, the rate of the rise in prices is dropping. So it's true, things haven't gone down in price, but they have risen in price slower than a year ago and before. But despite all the planning of the Federal Reserve and all the predictions made by all these brilliant economists, no one can actually see the future. Because if the Trump assassination actually succeeded, I think we would have been headed for a lot of turmoil and a much worse economic downturn. And that's not because I want Trump to win the election. It's just when an American president or a former American president who's running to be president again gets assassinated, that just creates a lot of internal dissent leading to instability, leading to an uncertain market. My name is the Geo Hussar. If you found this post useful, give me a follow.